thanks for joining us today. Um, my, uh, I am usually the host of the webinar, and today I am presenting. I am so honored to be presenting. So my name is Laura Riskus. I am the Director of Learning Strategy. Um, I have my colleague Tim Youngman joining us today. Uh, he's a Learning Solutions Architect uh, with Cavio. So Tim, thank Hi, you so much morning. for joining us. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here and happy to help. Fantastic. Well, why don't you uh, introduce yourself uh, um, to our audience? Sure. As Laura already said, I'm uh, Tim Youngman. I am a learning solution architect with uh, Cavio. I've been with the organization for about uh, two years, and I uh, lead um, an analysis and design practice within the organization, uh, really working on the, uh, the front end with our customers, and then also working with our uh, project teams to ensure that as we develop learning solutions that our core business objectives are achieved um, or the customer's core business objectives are achieved. Um, I have uh, about 17 years of experience designing and developing uh, custom learning solutions and it's what I absolutely love to do. <laughs> Tim, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Tim is uh, is bringing the the certainly the training expertise to the table today, and um, I'm on the other side of bringing the change expertise to the table. So I joined Cavio in 2012. I lead a lot of the strategic initiatives for our clients, uh, along with my colleague Ashley, and uh, I am certified in ProSight change management. Uh, along with I got a refresh on my change management foundation certification last year. Or so. Uh, we're really we're thrilled to have you join us today. We're excited to be presenting. So before we start, we're going to talk a little bit about Cavio. Uh, Cavio is a learning consulting organization, and our passion is to drive business value for and through learning. We look at learning from a standpoint of how to quantify the business investment in learning. That's one of the biggest aspects of what we do, and we do it in everything. And it's how we work. It's mission critical to make sure that the organization understands the value of learning and as a result that they understand how important it is to bring learning to the table early. We have amazingly talented people here at Cavio and they have a depth of expertise that's hard to beat. We have been there in your shoes, we've been there and done that, and uh, we aim to understand your organization and uh, your group in a way that helps you address your challenges and hopefully illuminate some possibilities too. Our focus on performance helps us to help you achieve your goal. So whether it be in learning, strategy, learning and performance solutions, uh, learning technology, or just helping your team manage their day-to-day -day work or big projects, we're absolutely here to help. So that's my little qu uh, quick spiel on Cavio. And so let's go ahead and start along on the, our path to change and training. So one of the things we, we're going to start with is there's, and, and I know that symbiosis is a, it's a term that is usually used in nature, um, but I felt like it was a really good term, uh, certainly as it relates to an interdependent or mutually beneficial relationship uh, between two people or, or groups. And certainly many of you I know have probably done change management and training. Usually uh, you've done change management, you might not even know it. Um, so, or, you know, I started to do training and I, you kind of, you kind of, st you kind of trip into it. So, um, what we're going to do is talk about some of the benefits between leveraging some of the areas of each change and training. So when we look at analysis and planning, they're both exceedingly important activities and they are a little bit different, but there's information that can be obtained in both that can benefit, mutually benefit each other. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is really how training can benefit from change. Now, um, one of the things that certainly is important in change is really understanding of, of the current state in order to know what needs to change. And sometimes training doesn't have a deep enough context, um, but change will go through that and uh, really identify what those what the true change is. Um, Tim, I know when we were talking about this with training, I, I know that there is absolutely a training needs analysis that's normally done, right? There's uh, 
you know, usually we do a training needs analysis as uh, a part of a uh, learning solution, and we certainly try to understand the uh, the target audience, what their day to day lives are like, and how training will impact them. I think one of the things that uh, the training um, organizations do not always do to the same extent that a change organization would do is uh, really try to look at things from a more organizational wide perspective. Yeah. So we may be looking at something in um, sort of a microcosm, but we don't necessarily consider how the entire organization is changing. Um, so, you know, from a training perspective, what we're really trying to do is we're really trying to drive a true behavioral change. Um, but I think one of the things that is really important and where change comes into play is understanding um, some of the, uh, the more organizational dimensions that may actually impact um, the success of driving that true behavioral change. Yeah, that's that's absolutely spot on. I think we're, you know, we're definitely going to talk a lot. And as Tim mentioned, we're going to talk a lot about that organizational aspect of it as well. And I, one of the things that I know in change management and certainly being a part of learning strategy, one of the exercises that we do normally is to interview stakeholders and really have get a good sense of what the real change is to address. And um, sometimes if you, if you have, if, even if you look at previous changes, um, training can start to possibly see some patterns. So there's ways that training can engage either change management tactics or actually engage the change management team if you have a team uh, in your organization and really get a sense of what some of the previous changes were and what the real changes were. Uh, to really get a depth of understanding of of what you might be up against, so to speak, from a change perspective. When you talk about planning, um, this is where I think change can definitely benefit from some of the some of the uh, activities that training does. It's it's very often that change has limited resources. Uh, it's it, usually having change management resources is a luxury, um, and to do a thorough analysis takes a lot of work and a lot of time. And if you only have one person or a half a head count to do to address change or just a few hours of people's time, it's very difficult to get through that analysis. One of the other challenges too is, is identifying some of the existing skill sets, um, especially if you're dealing with a large scale effort. Uh, you tend to be able to have your audience segmented, but you might not know the depth of some of those skill sets. And in both of those areas, I know, Tim, we were talking about that's where training can help for sure. Right, because as one of the uh, activities that, uh, that we really try to do at the beginning is really understand the audience very deeply, even in some cases going to the, uh, the level of uh, developing a persona of the target audience, and in some cases, we'll develop uh, multiple uh, personas, um, especially if we have a very segmented audience, so that we understand uh, to to a level of detail, you know, some of the uh, the different uh, levels of experience, um, levels of education, you know, even uh, comfort with uh, technology is something that. Uh, that we still encounter sometimes as a uh, as an issue, so we really try to get a very clear picture of the audience that we're trying to target, and what we find sometimes is we need slightly different uh, learning solutions to address the different target audiences, and especially when we do a very thorough task analysis, we find that different uh, audiences need different information and may also need that information presented in different ways. So all of that work that we do on the front end in terms of developing uh, personas is something that um, 
is something that uh, change can really benefit from. So as a part of our planning process, it's something that can help with a change initiative. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt. There's a couple of times I certainly could have used it in change initiatives. Uh, no question about that. Okay, so we're going to start a poll. I'm going to go ahead and uh, see how good my um, see how good my uh, WebEx is here. I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll here. One of them is we want to find out how you have been involved in change management activities. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll. Let me see. All right. All right. I've go ahead. I've uh, launched that poll. So if you can let us know if uh, you don't have any change management resources and you do all the training or uh, you team up with your change management leads regularly, um, if you haven't really thought about it or if you know what, don't make me think about change, <laughs> which is pretty realistic. So, all right. This will be very, this is, I'm excited about this poll because it'll be interesting to see, certainly. All right, fantastic. Well, I'm going to head, I'm going to go ahead and uh, close the poll uh, in just a minute. Just go ahead and close that. And um, I just want to share with you that it looks like we had 46% that don't uh, have any change management resources and you do all the training. That is actually aligned with some findings from ProSci. It was, it was not long ago, I want to say it was, well, it was about maybe uh, seven or eight years ago. Uh, they found that 68% of the training, 68% uh, of change management and uh, is done with, within training. 42% uh, of you say that you team up with your change management leads regularly. I think that's fantastic. You can probably... We're preaching to the choir probably for you on this one um, and would love to hear from you along the way as to how you have benefited from teaming up with your change management leads. And 6% uh, uh, haven't really thought about it. That's okay. That's great. Um, this is really where we want you to maybe think of where there are some opportunities, whether it be taking a change management approach uh, to learning or whether it be that you actually have some change management resources that you can engage. And 6% don't make me think about change. Hmm, I get you there. Uh, there's a lot of change saturation or oversaturation that's occurring in a lot of organizations right now. I think um, uh, if you'll talk about change saturation, a lot of people will laugh and say, what do you mean? Like we're going through change all the time. So I think that's uh, most likely uh, something that is exceedingly, uh, exceedingly real in our world today, no doubt. Thank you so much for participating in the poll. All right, so we're going to, I'm going to actually, uh, I'm going to just uh, just take a, a minute and um, I wanted to address, uh, there was a couple of comments here that I think are really great. Um, so I, I want to make sure, basically, uh, one of, somebody had mentioned um, that they bump into leaders who think training is change management. And I'm, I'm telling you, that is so much the case. Um, it's, it's, and this is where... I think that um, you kind of get stuck with being the uh, the only aspect of change management and training. So we'll absolutely continue to discuss a little bit about that and um, what tools are available for you because it's difficult. I know. <laughs> yep, I, I I get you for sure. So, all right. So let's talk a little bit about uh, symbiosis and measuring success. Now, certainly tra training and change measures are very different. And there is a benefit to using both training and change measurements, and especially when you're evaluating outcome-based success. Sometimes, you know, sometimes training is just required and it, you just have to take it. It's com but even compliance-based training may have some outcomes that you want to make sure you're measuring. And um, each of them can benefit, each change in training can benefit from really seeing these. So, Tim, if you can enlighten us on your thoughts about using Bloom's taxonomy um, in regards to change and training, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I, you know, I think uh, I think from uh, from a training perspective, and I'm working under the assumption that uh, that 
in many cases, what we're trying to do is move beyond uh, knowledge and comprehension to true application. And as we move into application, what we're really concerned about is making sure that uh, that people are actually implementing and um, applying what they have learned in the context of their uh, their position. So I think from a train, training perspective, we really tend to focus quite a bit on the uh, the cognitive uh, domain and to some degree the uh, the psychomotor um, domain. What I think we do from the affective domain is um, is picked up a little bit from the uh, from the personas in sort of understanding a bit on the front end what the audience is like and making sure that uh, we design solutions that uh, that are appropriate for the audience from that affective domain. I think one of the uh, the areas where we really try to get some additional support from change management is really primarily in that affective domain. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that's where, you know, I think that can also provide a lot of insight, certainly. Um, and, I, you know, you had mentioned something that I thought was really great in the fact that using Bloom's taxonomy really does, it, it's, gr it's a great platform when you're talking between change and training. Um, because they are two separate things, and um, when you're talking through with 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 leaders, understanding the difference between the two of them, this is a very good way to do so. Absolutely. All right. So this is this really Bloom's taxonomy is is. Um, I, I figured I, but Tim was talking about Bloom's taxonomy, and I thought, well, I need to bring my change game to the table too. So ProSize ADCAR model, and this was really uh, uh, from a book written by Jeff Hyatt, who, um, who is founder of, of the ProSci um, model and uh, the ProSci methodology. Um, this really illustrates the five steps that an individual goes through with change. And understanding this, especially for those of you who are um, either responsible for change and training, you know, I've noticed in some of the comments, uh, we have somebody who... Um, recently, the change management lead, learning experience lead, merged into one role, and um, to understand what you're addressing in training is a, is is important um, because sometimes you have to address all this in one event. Um, other times, if you have a training event, you might not have awareness and desire, and you're giving all of your all of your learning audiences, you're giving all of your stakeholders knowledge. But if they don't have the awareness and desire, um, they, they're not going to be able to receive the knowledge. They'll almost black that out. I mean, if you think about it, right. I love to, I, right? <laughs> so, well, yeah. and, that's where, and that's where thinking about, you know, something that uh, is a holistic approach is really a very important piece. Exactly. Um, because we know that there is the, uh, the knowledge event. But when you think about it more holistically, especially if it is something that is uh, a major uh, training program or a major training initiative, building that awareness and desire um, even prior to actually providing the, uh, the formal or even the, uh, the informal training is really important. So you can, uh, you can do some very interesting things from a marketing perspective to let people know that uh, that something is going to be changing even prior to the uh, the knowledge. So I think one of the things that is really important, kind of building on the uh, the ProSci model, is that um, the training should not be the first exposure that somebody has to um, to an upcoming uh, change that is going to happen in the organization. Absolutely, and, and we we had one of our participants just mention that, you know, that that's where a lot of the the resistors and saboteurs live in that lack of desire, and sometimes even lack of awareness. Well, no one told me, so um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you know, and I also think too that learning 
uh, beyond just knowledge, learning actually um, helps to provide some reinforcement. I know we were talking about uh, measurements after, you know, after learning. And, um, you know, one of the benefits of sometimes you're going to do a, you know, a three month after follow up of, of learning. And uh, between the learning event and that three month follow up, I know, Tim, we were talking about the use of coaching um, and mentoring in those areas, uh, especially, like you said, when we talk about a holistic uh, approach that really helps with that reinforcement piece. Absolutely, and I think that's one of the things that uh, that we have to consider as learning desi designers is not only the uh, the formal training that we put into place, but also making sure that uh, that we have some mechanism for peer to peer support, building that uh, community of learners, and also thinking in terms of uh, mentoring and coaching. In building the competencies within the uh, the management team to support the uh, the overall change, and so again, kind of going back to that holistic perspective, it's not just about uh, the formal training event. It's really what comes before and what comes after that can really drive the success of a uh, a change initiative. And then I think the other thing that uh, really is important is that uh, that reinforcement piece and how people are actually um, implementing the, um, the information they've learned. What are their success stories and what are the areas where they, where they uh, may have challenges? Absolutely. And I think sometimes from a formal uh, training perspective, it uh, can come across you certainly try to build it based on best practices, but especially when you are implementing something that is brand new, there is an opportunity for better practices to emerge as you are actually applying uh, what you have learned. And I think having an opportunity to share some of those uh, best practices or best practices and the challenges to further improve processes is an important part of the overall change. Yeah, absolutely. All right. All right, so the shared goal of application. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about um, that. And Tim and I, when we were talking about this, um, Tim brought up this as a really good point. There's, when you attend a training or when you attend any type of, when you obtain knowledge, there is an expectation for you to change. Uh, it's, you learn it and so now you know it, so you need to change. Um, and usually the application of the, of the information that you learn, um, it needs, obviously, that's when it's applied, right? You, you learn it and then you do it. Um, this always can be identified in post-training surveys, right? Do you, do, you, do you think the training was helpful? Do you think you're going to use it on your job, right? But actually doing it is where that change occurs. So change management is really focused on are you doing it? And sometimes training will focus on is there an intent to do it? Because that's really all you have the ability to, to measure simply because you may be going at the speed of light and trying to catch up with all the other training activities that you need to take care of in your role. Um, Tim, did we, uh, I know that we talked a little bit about this certainly, and um, that, and this really has to do, when we go back to ADCAR, um, obtaining that knowledge is, is required to make the change, right? So you have to make that change and you have to um, have the knowledge to do so. So when you go back to ADCAR, um, if you don't have the knowledge, you can't, you can't get through that, so you can't even apply it. So that's why training is 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 really an essential point, a part of change management. Right, and one of the things that uh, that we tend to uh, to measure, um, you know, early on after the training is that, as Laura mentioned, the intent to apply. So if you have a excellent training program, people may be uh, very excited about the actual training. Um, but then if you measure it again 
um, two or three months later and see to what degree they have actually applied that in the context of the position in the role there may actually be a difference between the intent to apply and the actual application. And one of the things that, uh, that we sometimes find is that there is a cultural resistance to actually applying that, uh, that information. So, you know, you may want to change, but if uh, the, rest of the, the rest of your peers are really resistant to it, um, there may be that cultural norm that holds you back. And so like with a new system implementation, for example, um, you may have to use the system to actually record information, but you may still be using the, uh, the crutches of uh, spreadsheets or previous ways that you mm -hmm. did it before the implementation um, and just using the uh, the technology to record that information. So yeah. it doesn't necessarily make things more efficient. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's certainly to your point, that's where the reinforcement takes place. So sometimes, um, sometimes the training, although while it's essential, um, it requires really that whole uh, kind of to be packaged along with change. I wanted to right. inquire, um, from the from the participants, uh, and I, I will take a look through this as you submit. Um, if you can respond in the comments how you're currently measuring your training, uh, your training success, that would be great. Um, we want to kind of take a look at that, and and we'll revisit this uh, towards the end of the session. Um, but I think that would be uh, something that um, will be helpful for everybody to take a look and see how everybody is measuring their training. So if you would, in the, in the comments, go ahead and respond, and I'll make sure that we, uh, we share that information. All right, super. Let's go back to, let's go to the uh, symbiosis and changing behavior while, our, while everybody is uh, submitting their responses. Um, and, and I, I, I spoke about this a little bit, touched about this on the last slide, but real true behavioral change is, is one of the goals of you know, training and certainly of change management. Um, you're really looking for a behavioral change. And it, it really asks you whether you're thinking about something or how you do something, it asks you to change that. Um, so that is a very common, certainly a common goal in learning and, in learning and change management. Um, as we mentioned, behavioral change is a choice. You choose to go to training, you choose to apply that learning, and you choose to really make it part of your day to day. So I think that I think that you know when we talk about learning, that really happens all the way through. Um, you're continuously learning, not just about the event or the the topic itself, but you're also learning about what you need to do and what you need to change and maybe some of your areas where it's it's so much better um, now that you've learned this new skill and other areas where it might be a little bit more challenging and that's sometimes in that area of new beginnings um, I, I that's kind of somewhat pulled from bridges where you start to get into these new beginnings uh, and you have a sense that Oh, things are good. Things are. Uh, this is this is looking like it's going to be a positive thing for me. Um, and then, of course, you move into the behavior being changed, and it really becomes your day to day. You know, it's it's kind of everything. Everything it just is ingrained in what you do. Um, there is absolutely a decision that is implicit in both change and training, and you choose as you go through each of these areas or each of these stages. You really do choose. Um, if it's something that's for you, if you get into the new beginnings and your performance, uh, you know, everybody usually expects a dip in performance and certainly in change when you first start to implement something. But if it doesn't come back up and it, you lose performance and you are not working as efficiently as you were before, you're more likely to resist this change and you're more likely to not adopt um, and possibly be very vocal about that depending on who that is and develop, there, there could be some resistance, and that could be for a very good reason as well. Um, that's why I think it's really important from a change perspective to be listening in all of these areas. 
Um, but with learning, I know, Tim, we were talking about sometimes learning, it's kind of done right after the develop understanding that event is completed, correct? Uh, yes. Yeah, and so sometimes it's it just is done, and then there's there's nothing else after that um, besides maybe some surveys. But it depends if you have a big program and you're engaging the, the managers to provide feedback, what have you. Um, it it really can be a much more powerful learning um, experience for people. So that's a pretty common element between both of them. Tim, I know we taught you. You shared with me a story about um, a training event or a training experience that you had, and uh, where change may have been helpful. Yeah, I a number of years ago, I was uh, I was actually doing a, uh, a task analysis for. It was actually in the context of uh, an underwriting program, and the, what they wanted to do was uh, cross-train the uh, the underwriters to work on different types of uh, loans. And so, as a part of that uh, process, we interviewed uh, expert uh, performers as well as performers who were considered um, either new or, you know, somewhat experienced. And as we interviewed uh, and uh, documented the uh, the different tasks, what we realized is that uh, that a core difference between the uh, the expert performers and some of the people who are newer is the expert performers actually had developed uh, more efficient ways to uh, to complete their tasks. But it was information that was not um, necessarily shared. So if I'm an expert performer, I want to keep that knowledge to myself so I can continue to be an expert performer. And that was part of the uh, the cultural norm of uh, this particular organization. And we realized that there was not a lot of um, sharing that was occurring in the organization. And so we felt like there was a real opportunity there, not only to uh, to do the uh, the cross training, but also to look at that cultural norm of not really sharing information about how you were doing your uh, how you were doing your tasks more efficiently, because that certainly could have helped other people be more efficient, um, handle more um, loans, and make the overall organization more efficient but that was something that uh that you know when we brought it to the uh the management team they were not interested <laughs> yeah. in um in some of the uh the cultural norms of their organization they were really very focused on we just want to make sure that we get the training out there and as we uh continued to work with them and measured it, what we really found is that there was a slower adoption to the uh, the cross-training initiative. What happened was um, as people um, started to work on different types of loans, um, they were not necessarily efficient, and they would go back to, uh, to the experts and route those loans back to the experts. Oh, wow. So the, uh, the actual cross-training while they may have gained the familiarity of working on different types of loans, they didn't necessarily apply that uh, that behavior. They tended to favor what they had been doing in the past. So, um, so I think the lesson that uh, that we learned there is it's not really just about the training in many cases. It's really about the uh, the organizational uh, culture for something like that, and whether it is an organization that is open to changing some of it, its cultural norms to improve the uh, the efficiency of the organization. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think you know change management. The intention of change management is to um, create a you know create faster adoption. Ultimately, at the end of the day. Um, but I think also unearthing what that true issue is and that resistance is uh, is important 
as you know, what what you need to address in, and I think you know you were talking about this, Tim, in, in a holistic training uh, solution where that that does kind of address with a holistic solution. You are addressing change management, right? Absolutely, because if you look at something from a holistic perspective, you do consider you do consider all of the uh, all of those dimensions, and I think that's where the uh, the change management expertise can really come into play, because they are going back to the uh, the, the Bloom's taxonomy. They really are looking very much at the uh, the affective uh, domain, whereas training. Um, may touch on that to to some degree so if uh if we start to work together and start to look at it uh more holistically we start to think about some of the um reinforcement that occurs afterwards yeah absolutely i think that's um that's absolutely something that's key uh, we talk about training supporting change uh, this is where you know, if you if, when you're thinking of change from a training, and we were just talking about this from a holistic solution perspective, you are addressing change and training. One of the things I know we were talking about, Tim, was that it, it was about telling the story all the way through. So while while training might not necessarily be uh, what I would call, it, they shouldn't be the only um, venue or uh, uh, vehicle for communication. Um, there is an important aspect of messaging in a holistic solution. There's no doubt about it. If you have a story that you're telling and you build it with, if we think of the ad car model and you build it with awareness and then there's desire and then there's knowledge, um, those, all of those have to do with the communication beforehand, the sponsorship, uh, potentially engaging your change agents and coaching and if you are able to identify, uh, really get a good pulse of what are some of the things that, what are some of the messages that people need reinforced? Uh, what are some of the some of the key messages that people might not need? They might not need. They might need a little bit more uh, help absorbing and understanding maybe what it means to them in their role, what the what the uh, the initiative means to them in their day to day work. Uh, that's where training can really, really help with that messaging. And then certainly when you talk about coaching um, and and kind of that follow up, and even with the surveys. So uh, we'll we'll get back to um, how people are measuring shortly. But even with surveys, um, the words that you use and and the vernacular that you use is is key in really telling that whole story. Tim, did you have anything to add on that, or should we just go ahead and keep moving? No, I, you know, I think one of the things that uh, that I would reinforce, I, I, I go back to uh, to that example of, of the uh, the underwriters, and you know, had they uh, started to think a little bit more about some of the uh, the cultural dimensions and started to think more about sharing information more openly. That's where they would have had the opportunity to build some of the communities of practice that we talked about early on, so that rather than um, just routing, you know, a loan to somebody, you would actually instead have some sort of a uh, information resource that could help you, um, and that is something that I think is really important as a part of a change initiative is uh, building that. Uh, community of practice where everyone is absolutely supporting each other and mentoring each other through the process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, when you're talking about mentoring and supporting each other through the process, one of the things that is really important with change is giving people a uh, opportunity to practice uh, whatever that new process, technology, Whatever that may be, is it's a way to pre you want to be able to give people an opportunity to practice that and internalize it before it goes live, before they know that you know the spotlight's on them and now they have to perform it perfectly. Um, to take some of that stress off, you want to give them an opportunity to practice, and training provides that ability to do so. So anytime you're in a test environment, 
you know, you'll know the difference when if any of you have done technology training and you tell people this is a sandbox, you can work in it, it's okay. Um, there's a little bit more of a, uh, there's a little bit more relaxed, you know, relaxed approach to it. Um, people feel like, ooh, they'll still go, ooh, I think I made a mistake. Can you help me with this? Um, but if you're in a live environment, they'll be less uh, apt to like click on certain buttons and go, oh, I don't want to break something, or I, I think it's something I'm going to mess something up horribly. And that's the same way they feel about change. So, you know, by giving people an opportunity to practice, sometimes it's having crucial conversations, sometimes it's 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 listening skills, sometimes it's some of those soft skills, um, but having the ability to practice, uh, there's a lot of times where in a change of in a change of, um, uh, initiative, you'll give managers or some some of the key stakeholders, you'll give them uh, or the change agents, you'll give them a list of you know, some of the questions that you might expect and, and how you might want to address them or answer them. If it ends up being something that might be a little bit more emotional, uh, it might be a good idea to give them kind of like some scenario or some role-playing practice on that. Uh, this is something that that's absolutely where training can help in that. Um, there, there might already be programs that you can leverage. And we talk about helping manage and build the competencies to support the change. This is exactly what I'm referring to is the the actual event or the 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 ability to support a change requires a certain skill set that some have and some do not. Um, certainly, as you if you're a change management lead, you're looking at who your sponsors should be because they're usually people who are very knowledgeable in change. But the biggest area of resistance for change are middle managers, and those people really need a lot of support. And sometimes they're swamped. They're getting hit by all different directions. And they need to be able to know, what do I need to do? How do I need to answer this? Who, do I, who can I go to for help? If, um, you know, if, who can I send my people to for help? Um, they're really well-intentioned, and they want to make sure they're taking care of everything. But some of those competencies, this is where training, you can see, have have we rolled out like a crucial conversation training? Have we rolled out listening skills? Is there something? Do we have micro learning that we can send out to them? Maybe, you know, a, a little a little three minute tidbit once a week or things like that, where those can help to support the change and support your groups. Oh, Tim, communities of practice. That's one of our favorite things. <laughs> Communities of practice. We uh, we we have communities of practice within Cavio, but we also, um, when we've worked with our clients, talked about implementing communities of practice to help knowledge sharing and support the change. Um, it's not just about um, you know, like in Tim's example previously, uh, you know, having a community of practice and encouraging people to share knowledge is key. That's really important. Uh, part of that is behavioral. Part of it is giving people an opportunity to share and setting that up. And um, sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's even having people to say, gosh, you know, I, I struggled with this. And somebody goes, yeah, I know that was so hard. I, you know, it took me like three weeks to get through um, understanding that process. And as soon as I got and understood, you know, this particular aspect of it, it made it a lot easier. As soon as I was able to turn on this particular feature, um, and get those alerts that help me. These are the, these absolutely help with change and manage resistance, and that's what training does at the end of the day. It, training manages resistance. If you don't have training in your change initiative, um, you're going to have a lot of resistance to manage. And training might not always be obvious. It, it might it might be something where you say we have an organizational change. And an organizational change might not require anybody learning anything or having any additional skills on the surface, but then you start to look and say, oh, wow, you know, we need to be able to, um, these might be some, some other um, opportunities of training that we can give to people to help them feel a little bit more confident and to give them a two-way communication vehicle. That's key, especially if you've got highly emotional changes going on. Um, that two-way communication is essential to managing resistance. So sometimes uh, you guys, you all know, right? Sometimes um, training is 
uh, part knowledge and part therapy. I, you all know that, I'm certain. And uh, that's where it's absolutely essential in change. No question about it. All right. All right. And, you know, again, reinforcing that, uh, that management does not necessarily always have the, uh, the competencies to support change. And no. I know we mentioned it uh, earlier, but, you know, that is an important part of uh, your overall analysis from a training perspective. It's understanding to, to what degree uh, managers already have some of those uh, competencies. And if they don't have the, uh, the competencies, especially with a large training program that's something that, or a large uh, change initiative, you absolutely need to start to think about the, uh, the mechanisms to build um, change um, competencies within your management team. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a fact. So I'm going to go back just uh, in a second before we go to summarize. I did promise to share some of the information on the metrics. And uh, what was interesting, I'm actually just going to go back up here, but what's interesting is that um, of the people who, of our attendees who responded, we actually had an equal set um, of, it was kind of like 33% of each one of them. Um, there was really uh, one set that really dealt with levels, Kirkpatrick levels one and two. And that's pretty common, right, Tim? It is common. I mean, that's, that's where, <laughs> I think that's where most, uh, most training initiatives uh, tend to stop is they tend to stop at that uh, level two, but it's it's really the level three analysis where you're really measuring that application that you can evaluate the overall uh, success of the uh, the training program from cha from the perspective of changing behavior. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And then the second level, because I know uh, some of you mentioned that you're doing one and two or you're doing some basic stuff, you know you want to do more. And I know sometimes that does have to do with just the speed of the car, so to speak. Um, but there's, there's a second level that's really um, that survey, right? And that's pretty, that's pretty common as well. But um, it, it, that, was, that was pretty standard. I think it was kind of, you know, Maybe two weeks out, um, some of them say they ask, you know, they ask uh, uh, some specific questions, um, and and that's pretty common too. Uh, usually, Tim, usually, what is the standard uh, of time frame for sending out a survey post post training that you've seen? I usually, if I'm doing an application level, I would usually do it about uh, two to three months out. Um, and you know there there are some different ways that uh, that you can measure application level. Um, you know, to some degree, you can even just do you know simple things like uh, survey surveying people to find out to what degree they feel they have actually applied the information, and then um, you know compare that with uh, with a survey that you would send to uh, to managers. If it is something that is really critical, um, really crucial, you can actually start to do some level of uh, observation. Um, we find that uh, that observation is not necessarily it, it is less common at level three than doing the surveys, but it is certainly an option, or even uh, small groups and uh, focus active or focus group activities can help you with level three. But, you know, it's it's really kind of planning out uh, your whole measurement uh, plan in advance and uh, figuring out exactly how you're going to do that. And you really need to think about the degree of change in order to figure out the, uh, the, the tactics that you want to use in terms of uh, the measurement program. Yeah. And, and, you know, to your point, we had the same amount of people who did talk about um, they did some progress reports, some post follow up, uh, some observation, uh, supervisor feedback. Um, I'll tell you, as a change management person, ah, oh, that is gold. Seriously, that is gold. It helps you to understand if, there, if there's resistance, if there's challenges, um, where they might be. 
um, you know, even if you're a change management person, you're also looking to say, okay, where is it at? Who is it? Who's who is it happening with? Because it's not so much about you know going out and shaking your finger at people, but it is understanding why they're having that challenge. Because um, sometimes you are. I always say that change management people are kind of like double agents. Um, they they have to be working for the people who are making the change, and they also have to be working for the people who are experiencing the change. Uh, because sometimes it, sometimes it's 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 a hard. It's a very difficult. A message to bring back to say this is not a beneficial change for this particular group of people and uh, to be able to have the data behind that is key because if you just go back and say you know I've heard this and if it's all water cooler type of information it's it's difficult to quantify right it's it's all hearsay um, if you have measurements and you have information on it um, it certainly leadership is much more apt to understand and listen um, and uh, provide some some thoughts on next steps depending on you know depending on the flexibility of the change sometimes it's sometimes it's not it's it's not negotiable but other times it is for sure all right I do want to go back I'm actually going to share the the closed poll for a minute because I did want to share with you um, as we saw there was you know, there was 46% uh, of you that don't have any change management uh, resources. And I hope from, from seeing this that uh, there's so many times that the event of training is the change. That is the change management. So by identifying um, and asking some of these questions ahead of time and uh, seeing if they can, and sometimes it's not even getting a resource, but getting that information so that you can wrap some of those messages um, maybe even some of the uh, an analysis uh, around your training uh, you know think about things not just from a uh, from a gap perspective as far as skill set is concerned but maybe what's going on in the organization um, that will really help um, set your training up for success no question about it and for those of you who team up with your change management leads regularly certainly I think this will give you, um, if you haven't already, if, uh, if either we're preaching to the choir, which is possible, or we have provided you with um, some thoughts and some other discussions to have with your change management leads, or for those of you who are change management leads and, and have attended this session, to reach out to your training people early and often. Uh, they may have a lot of information that will save you a ton of time. And um, certainly for those of you who are in the uh, C and D area, certainly I hope this has provided some uh, helpful information for you. And um, certainly uh, we're always here to help too. So on that note, I do want to just summarize and engaging training early is key. It's, it's important and establishes an environment for all employees to succeed. Um, and it does absolutely help manage resistance. There's no question about it. Um, and when you apply a change management approach to your solutions, you, you can find some other aspects um, of the training that is related to the change. So it might not necessarily be, in Tim's example, um, it might not necessarily be just the technology that you're training on or the process that you're training on. But there might be some other um, avenues where you can uh, consider some holistic approaches, you know, such as in implementing microlearning, mentoring, coaching, those type of things. And by addressing those, all both of those along with training, it can really set your training effort up for success. So as we mentioned, that training effort is the big thing, right? Some people say, I don't, I really don't know what I'm getting into until I really see it and I go into the system and I touch it. And usually that that's where it happens. It's training is where that happens. So um, that can set everything up for success. Certainly, I hope uh, I, if you have any questions, please go ahead, put them into the text, um, or the chat window before we, uh, and then we will address them before we close up today. Um, in the meantime, we can certainly help. If you don't have change management resources and uh, need some help, or if you see that there's an opportunity, uh, we can absolutely do that. We are, uh, we do strategic learning consulting. Uh, certainly focused on kind of the bigger picture of your learning organization. Uh, we 
we also obviously uh, Tim as Tim mentioned we provide learning techno or learning and performance solutions really focusing on you know what are the what are the the holistic solutions we can provide for you we have um, phenomenal instructional designers and um, and uh, our solution architects like Tim at Cavio um, we also help develop and deploy learning solutions and focus on you know everything configuration through the processes that support that technology and execution support is all about how we can help your team manage that day-to-day -day work so we have a very different approach to doing managed services uh, some of our clients we identify some bits and pieces and parts they need outsourced all the way through uh, outsourcing all of the departments so um, so I, I wanted to just uh, quickly identify a couple of the a couple of the questions here, and I think uh, we have a really good question. One question is, how do you measure change? Um, I, there's a couple ways to measure change. Uh, you can actually, and it depends upon the change. One of a, a very common element of measuring change is what I call a barometer, and what it is is if you identify what your success factors are ahead of time. So um, I, I'm going to use, uh, you know, I'm going to use an uh, a, uh, example of, uh, let's just use an example of help desk, right? So you know that you, um, you need to make sure that your help desk folks, uh, you're going to be implementing a new software. And the software is supposed to help with uh, turning over, uh, with eliminating some of the, uh, the higher uh, escalated tickets, let's just say. Um, and you, what you do is you identify some of these changes up front, right? But the changes really occur with, are they, are they able to, the change agents, are they able to handle some of these situations easier because this information is available? That really has to do with perception, and it really has to do with feeling. So there, what we do is we often create a, kind of like a barometer or a gauge. We talk to the stakeholders. Um, we have our change agents talk and, and, and get some feedback who they're kind of out in the field, right? Um, we also, and I hate to say that we do surveys, but we do, we do pulse surveys. Um, we try to consolidate the pulse surveys with any other surveys that are going on or, or looking at some other surveys. Um, it, I will be perfectly honest that when you measure change, you're talking about looking at something from anywhere between 8 to 16 months. So in measuring a change, usually it doesn't occur in three months. You're looking at something from a long-term perspective. If you're talking about implementing software, usually you're implementing software. That is a change. And the, the implementation, you're done. That's great. But how has it been adopted? And how you measure that adoption has to do with are they using the spreadsheets? Are they, you know, to Tim's point, where they are they doing different processes? That requires a conversation, and so that's why that two-way having that two-way conversation and those two-way discussions are key. This is where your change agents are invaluable at best. So um, I will absolutely be happy to share some of this with you, and um, I think that as we move to the end of the hour. Those are all the questions that we have. Oh, we do have a couple more questions here. Um, let's see. We have somebody who is in a relatively new learning initiative uh, with their organization, and it seems that leadership of the organization sees us as the source of change for many things without additional change management support. Any ideas on how to talk to the leaders about needing that change management support? Yes, absolutely. So change management, um, without change management, you will not get the adoption. And what the adoption means is that you will not see people really doing it day to day. They will not incorporate that into their day to day work regardless. They'll find workarounds. And the if you're a new learning organization without change management um, and you're responsible for providing learning or training for a large initiative, Without having it, it will fail. I believe, Tim, what is the metrics? It's something like 78% or something of all transformation uh, efforts fail. I think it's McKinsey, correct? 
Um, yeah, it's it's between it's seventy. Yeah, it's seventy percent is what's usually quoted. Yeah, and Sarah certainly you can reach out to me if you'd like. Um, I, I'd be happy to uh, give you some information on that too. There's a lot of great metrics around that. Um, even if you have the change management uh, 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 capability in your learning organization, you can help to uh, address those. And uh, but that uh, again, you know, as we talked about, that requires knowledge and understanding within your organization to do that. So absolutely. Well, I thank all of you for your time today, Tim. It was a pleasure presenting with you. And it was a pleasure to present with you as well. <laughs> Thank you, and I hope you all have a great day. We'll be sending out a link to the uh, recording after the session. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us at info at Thank you again for your time today. Bye-bye.